In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Saint Luke recounts towards the end of his Gospel that our Lord opened their minds, the apostles, to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. We know very well what our Lord was referring to. There was a descent of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, which would signal the real constitution of the Church as the mystical body of Christ with the Holy Spirit, like the third person of the Blessed Trinity, who can also be considered or understood as the gift of God of himself to man or to the spiritual creatures, because that includes the angels, would come. It's the rebreathing into man of that breath of life that happened in the first moment of his coming into being, God made man to his image and breathed into him the breath of life. We read in Genesis. And so therefore it's very clear that the apostles were in Jerusalem. I, we say this because we need to establish the timeline and we need to establish the spatial relationships of these events that we are meditating because we have to know the gospel very well. We have to know the acts of the apostles very well. The same way we know a movie, for example, where the events are clear in our mind, what things happen first and what things happen afterwards. We cannot know the gospel and the acts of the apostles like just a jumble of information versus that we may be able to quote every now and then, but not knowing when they really happened. This is the life of our Lord we're talking about. This is the work of the Holy Spirit that we're talking about. This is the reason for our faith that we are talking about. We should know, know these things and we should know them very well. Well, as St. Luke recounts or ends his gospel, he ends with this commentary. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them. Another information. So the ascension did not happen in Galilee, as some would say. It happened in Jerusalem, or near Jerusalem in Judea. From Easter Sunday, which happened in Jerusalem, the apostles went to Galilee, that's where the primacy, the declaration of the primacy would take place, the famous episode of Tabga. But then they went back to Jerusalem because our Lord told them to and to stay there. But meanwhile, what happened? This thing of staying there. This is what we read in the Acts of the Apostles which is like a continuation of the narrative of St. Luke because he is also the author of the Acts. And there's a reason why when we read the Acts of the Apostles, it begins this way. In the first book of Theophilus, St. Luke addresses himself to an imaginary Theophilus 
or maybe there was really a Theophilus, but we don't know. But that's the way he begins his narrative. In the first book, referring to the gospel, according to St. Luke, the first book that he wrote, that long gospel of St. Luke. In the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commandments through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. There's a continuity between the ending of St. Luke, the Gospel according to St. Luke, and the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. And then he says, To them he presented himself alive after his passion by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking of the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem. There's another thing. But to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but before many days you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. These days we had been going back and forth, reliving those Halcyon days of Easter. And the apostles euphoric with um, the events of Easter, the events of uh, the Sunday of the Resurrection, would be most probably talking about it the whole day, even when Jesus was not around. And of course, when Jesus was around, appearing to them with his glorious body, they would have had such get-togethers. How would those get-togethers have been? We kind of almost chide St. Luke or the rest of the evangelists for not having given us more details of those days, lumping them together as that our Lord was with them for 40 days. But if you read carefully, especially the Acts of the Apostles, you will see that there are enough details there that even if most of the accounts or the details mentioned by St. Luke in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, would be events that would happen beyond those 40 days. But they provide a kind of an ambiance, a rhythm, that makes us conclude that the 40 days that were not mentioned were pretty much the same. And what are the characteristics of those days? So when they had come together, St. Luke continues, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's so human, right? The apostle asking our Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? Still with the, the old triumphalistic, but political messianism that was so prevalent at that time and so ingrained in the mentality of the Jews. The restoration of the kingdom of Israel. It was not only Judas who was thinking that way. There was only, it was not only some of his disciples who wanted to make him king. The apostles themselves were thinking that way. It's, it's, it's logical. It's natural. It would take them some time to finally, shall we say, wrap their head around that idea, around that teaching of our Lord, that my kingdom is not of this world. It would need the descent of the Holy Spirit in order to finally open their minds to that revelation already prophesied by so many prophets but categorically stated by our Lord my kingdom is not of this world to finally understand it that they were meant for greater things 
Nowadays, there's a lot of talk about the separation of church and state, which I had always written about and corrected. There's no separation because how can there be separation of two institutions or two realities that involve the same set of people? Because the faithful in the church, especially in a Catholic country like the Philippines, are the same citizens of the Republic. So the two authorities, the ecclesiastical authority and the political authority, meaning to say the government, the state, are exercising their authority over the same subjects. So how can they be separated? What should happen is a distinction of what their, their competence is, a distinction of what they should be talking about. But not a separation, because otherwise you're going to split the people. We're all be schizophrenics. On Sundays, we're going to be Catholics, and the rest of the days, we're going to be Filipinos or citizens of the Republic of the Philippines. We're one and the same thing. So the citizen, if he's going to be a good citizen, also has to be a good faithful of the church, and vice versa, because we are... It's the same life that we're living. The same set, the same responsibilities that we're sanctifying, the same realities that we're leading towards God. So the correct expression is the distinction of competencies of church and state. But they overlap because life is a continuum. The, 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 the state is in charge of this part of this life more directly in charge of this part of this life in its temporal realities. And this, the church is looking to the whole of it all the way to eternity. So how do they deal with each other? Cooperation, understanding, mutual respect. The church can't say things regarding the political system. That's the reason why you know, every time election comes, the people, since they're good Catholics, always look to their shepherds asking who to elect. And the shepherds have always refused to get embroiled in that. What the church can do is establish the parameters, the principles, but the political option, that's, that belongs to the freedom and the glory of the children of God in your temporal life. But it cannot be separated in the sense that, you know, you're wearing two hats. Our Christianity, our Catholicism is not a hat that we put on on Sundays when we enter a church and then hang out there when we exercise our political options. Everything has a moral content. Everything temporal has a projection to eternity. What we do in the exercise of our political duties has moral ramifications. What we do there is either in keeping with our eternal destiny, in which case it's moral, it's good, and that's what we should do, or not. That's what we call consistency. That's what we call really honesty. But this has taken us far afield. We were considering what our Lord must have been telling them during those 40 days. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said this, and they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. That's the ascension, which is going to happen 40 days after the resurrection, after Easter, which we're going to celebrate a couple of weeks from now still, but which we're already considering now because we want to have enough time to meditate on the activities of the church, especially after Pentecost Sunday. Since the series of meditations will end on Pentecost Sunday, if we really follow the chronology, then we would end on Pentecost Sunday just when things would really start get, uh, getting excited as far as the acts of the apostles are concerned. So we're going to do 
something like, like what used to happen. You have to be 60 and above to remember the time when there were comics in a newspaper. But there was the daily edition and there was the Sunday edition of the comics. And they were not moving in sync all the time because the Sunday uh, edition had a way of moving ahead. Of course, it would only come every Sunday. And so therefore it jumps. So for those of us kids who were following you know, the events of Tarzan or the Phantom and uh, all those uh, characters, you read the Sunday comics, the Sunday version, which were uh, beside colored, in color rather, rather than black and white, which was a daily version. And the daily version was just three frames or four frames. The Sunday version uh, was as many as six frames, five at least. But it was something to look forward to because you get a peek ahead. Well, this is what's going to happen with these meditations of ours, vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the real movement of the liturgy. We're going to leapfrog forward in order to be able to consider the history of the early church. Why are we praying about that? Why are we contemplating that as the substance to the, the topic of our conversation with God? Because that's what this prayer, these meditations are. Because we want to learn. Because we want to be imbued by the same spirit as those men and women who live their faith radically to the point that they had no qualms about calling each other saints. Sometimes people look at that bygone era as a bygone era precisely with a mixture of admiration, but an admiration which is more of, in Spanish, the word admiración is not really admiration as it is in English. It's more of um, amazement. You know, that, that we look at it with amazement as if in disbelief. Uh, yes, we admire it in a sense, but it's too unbelievable to really emulate. Well, hopefully by meditating on the Acts of the Apostles and the events that happened there, we will be familiar enough with them that we hopefully become identified with them. That's the life that we need to emulate. That's the spirit that we need to incarnate. The spirit of early Christianity of people who live their faith radically, who walk the talk. It's not a question of dying, martyrdom. No, they became martyrs too, some of them, quite a number of them. But even more important is living like them. Sometimes I'm tempted to say, it's too easy to die for the faith. What is really important and what's interesting that what will really change the face of the earth is to live for the faith on a daily basis. Exercising our political options, uh, getting into business, getting rich, if that's the case. Generating economic activity. But all the time configuring this world, these temporal realities, according to what we see in prayer, according to what we have been inspired by the Holy Spirit to understand. There's a reason why God told Adam and Eve to go and multiply and fill the earth and to dominate it. Not to dominate it as he's throwing their weight around as they damn please, as somebody would say, but to dominate it. But at the same time, they subjecting themselves to the will of God. So in effect, what's going to happen is God is dominating creation. A big chunk of it directly, that's how he manages the planets and the stars and the physical laws of nature and the behavioral laws of the animals, but also indirectly through the instrumentality, through the agency of man. That is our role in the universe. How the early Christians must have felt this. You are the salt of the earth. Salt 
must be flavorful, must be salty. But if it loses its flavor, it loses its saltiness, of what good will it be except to be thrown away and trodden underfoot by men, our Lord said. A lamp is not lit to be put under the bushel, but on a lamp stand. A city set on a mountain top will be visible. You can't avoid it. Your Christianity will put you in the limelight in one way or another. I don't know why, but something comes to my mind right now. No, I don't know. I know why. Which is this phenomenon of the community pantries that all of you have been reading about. That grassroots exercise. And somebody red tagged them. That's the constant in this world, no? Why can't people allow others to take credit? Why can't people admire the goodness of others? Why do they have to pull them down to their own level of thoughtlessness many times? Just because you didn't think of it, you don't have to drag it down. The glory of your brother is your own glory too. So you glory in it as well. You be happy for the others. You cooperate with their initiative. And this works all around. The duly constituted authorities of this country, that's the president, that's, we have to cooperate with them because they're the ones that are there. If everybody would just criticize everybody else, we're not going to go anywhere. We have to get our act together. And that's what we read in the Acts of the Apostles. Because all the believers were of one mind, sat there praying and sharing everything. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. You see, that's where the, 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 uh, the, the ascension happened. And the Mount of Olives. Don't you know the Mount of Olives as one very particular? It's, it's quite a, an extensive territory. Remember that um, Bethany is in the uh, northern flank of uh, the Mount of Olives. The southern flank is facing Jerusalem, Mount Zion, that's another mount. But the Mount of Olives is extensive. It's there because it says he took them, Jesus took the disciples as far as Bethany. So therefore the far, the, um, the far side of the Mount of Olives, far from Jerusalem, that is going northwards. And that's where the ascension took place. But then the, the Acts of the Apostles say, look, the race, they went back to Jerusalem. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, that same upper room where they had celebrated the Last Supper. Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these, with one accord, devoted themselves to prayer, together with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Hmm. Let's say, there yeah, shall we say, the germ of the church. The apostles, I know Judas, so there were eleven together with the brethren of our Lord, brethren, yes, his relatives. Because the word brethren is the English translation of a Hebrew word, which means relatives that extend to uncles and nephews and cousins. But that's what brethren means. That should put to rest that age old uh, argument uh, regarding the virginity of Our Lady, saying that because the, the gospel says the brethren of our Lord. So our Lord had brothers. No, brethren means relatives. That's a problem with 
making arguments or getting into arguments regarding sacred, sacred scripture, basing yourself or themselves in the English translation. I mean, that doesn't make sense. They have to look at the original. And the original is Hebrew or Greek, koine. And there you will see what the real word is. And in this particular case, the word is relative. But you have them there, the apostles and some relatives of our Lord, some holy women around the mother of God, the mother of Jesus, Mary. And that is the picture of the human substrate of the early church. At that time, the Holy Spirit had yet, yet, not yet come in, and that's the reason why I keep on repeating that the church had not really existed yet, because it will come into being on the day of Pentecost. But the human substrate was already there. And what were they doing? Yes, they were praying. Prayer, prayer, prayer. If the Holy Spirit, if the soul is the soul of the church, remember the soul is the principle of life of anybody, then the activity, the primary activity of that body is to pray. Like, you know, when you're alive, what's your primary activity? Even before getting up and going around and doing things, well, you should be breathing and your heart should be beating and there are physiological mechanisms that we will be should be going on there. Well, in the church, the same thing. Before anything else, it should be praying. Because prayer is the expression of the life of the Spirit in the church. The activity of God within that church. Without prayer, there is no church. There's just a bunch of people perhaps um, trying to do something good. But with prayer, then it it starts being church. But well, they were praying. And what were they praying about? They were reliving the teachings of our Lord. Most probably at that time, they were already celebrating Mass. Because our Lord had told them, do this in memory of me. So they had been, uh, um, what they call this, reliving the Last Supper. They had been going through the same motions, the same procedure, because in the early church, the Mass was just that. The essence of the Mass is a double consecration. This is my body, this is my blood. But before that, in the Last Supper, they sang hymns. They had that agape meal, which was not really a meal, so to speak, because it was the Passover, very sparse meal, but which, were, which was rather, um, uh, what do you call this? Uh, paced by certain rituals. Singing of the hymn, reading of the scripture, then the consecration, and then the sharing, because our Lord said, take and eat, drink of the, of the blood. So they were doing that, and that was the Mass, a very simple celebration, so to speak. All through the centuries, things have been added, embellishing it, making it more meaningful, but that's, that was the core. And they were already doing that at that time. So reading the scripture, reliving the teachings of our Lord, and then the double consecration, celebrating the Mass. And in the center of that, all like the, the, uh, the unifying force that gathered them together, Our Lady. It's so important never to forget this. That from the very beginning, our Lady united the apostles, the disciples of our Lord together. So true is this. In the Second Vatican Council, <clears throat> Pope Paul VI declared, it's not a dogma, but okay, very close to it, the motherhood of Mary, that Mary is the mother of the church. On the 21st of November, 1964, at the closing of the third session of the Second Vatican Council, Paul VI solemnly proclaimed Mary, mother of the church. And he said, our vision of the church must include loving contemplation of the marvels which God worked in his Holy Mother. 
and knowledge of the true Catholic doctrine about Mary will always be the key to correct understanding of the mystery of Christ and of the church. Reflection on the close ties linking Mary and the church, so clearly indicated by the present constitution, he was talking about Lumen Gentium, allows us to think this is the most appropriate moment to satisfy a desire which, as we pointed out at the end of the last session, many council fathers had made their own, calling insistently for an explicit declaration during this council of the maternal role which the Blessed Virgin exercises towards the Christian people. To this end, we, using the majestic, maj majestic plural of his office as Pope, to this end, we have considered it opportune to dedicate a title in honor of the Virgin, which has been proposed in different parts of the Catholic world and which we find particularly touching. For it sums up in a wonderfully succinct way the privileged position which this council has recognized the Blessed Virgin to have in the church. And so, and here comes the solemn proclamation, for the glory of the Virgin and for our consolation, we proclaim Mary most holy to be the mother of the church, that is, mother of the entire people of God, faithful as well as pastors, who call her loving mother. And we desire that from now on, she be honored and invoked by the entire people of God under this most pleasing title. We have to end. We always end our prayer with reflections, resolution. This time, let's end it thinking of our Blessed Mother, our Mother, yours and mine, our Mother, yours, Jesus, and ours, our Mother, Mother of the whole church. What a consolation this gives us. Thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them to effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. <laughs>